welcome to the African Exodus Show. I'm your host, Tony Cherie, here to you with a new video. Before we get started with today's African News segment, I want to remind you, if you have not added yourself to my Telegram, that's the best way to stay connected outside of YouTube. In addition, I post videos that I don't want to post on YouTube there, so that's the best way to reach me. And also, if you would like to support this channel, you could do so on my Patreon. There you will also receive a weekly exclusive just for you. Blackwater founder calls on the U.S. to colonize Africa and Latin America. I was asked to give my thoughts on this particular story that came out. Let's get into the details. So according to a commentary from The Intercept, John Swartz, a former Navy SEAL and founder of a mercenary firm called Blackwater, he, um, Eric Prince has called on the United States to put the imperial hat back on and control massive parts of the globe again. Eric Prince is a former Navy SEAL who was behind the revival of the private security industry. Notoriously known for Blackwater and his involvement in the Iraq War, he established another private military company called Reflex Response, or R2, after he sold Blackwater to investors as an escape from controversy. The UAE, United Arab Immigrants, secretly hired both companies, Blackwater and R2, to go to Yemen. Blackwater, which has massacred scores of Iraqis and despised in Iraq more than the U.S. soldiers themselves, has taken pride in employing Colombians and other Latin American military personnel from soldiers to commanders. During his podcast Off Leash on Tuesday, Prince gave listeners his professional opinion that many nations around the world just did not have the capacity to govern themselves and that the U.S. should just swoop in and govern those countries instead because enough is enough. We're done being invaded. You can say that about pretty much all of Africa, he said. They're incapable of governing themselves. Swartz explains that imperialists have always told themselves that they are subduing other lands to help their benighted inhabitants. This benefit somehow always leads to mass death. He recalls how numerous comments made in the U.S. over the years in regard to the war in Iraq attempted to mask the invasion of Iraq as a struggle between good and evil with the Americas portraying themselves as intending to deliver freedom to Iraqis. Swartz explains that Prince's comments indicate that many of humanity's worst ideas are resurfacing. Now, my um, response to this, as soon as I read that he was a Navy SEAL, I said, okay, that, that makes sense. Because if you understand how there is a secret state that is at hand all over the world, all over the globe, that is controlling things behind the scenes, that is colonizing. Let's be very clear. Africa is still colonized. You don't have to recolonize it. You can more, um, more apparently colonize it, but you really can't recolonize something that's already colonized. Africa is still colonized. The biggest aspect of colonialism is economic control and using the political authorities to yield control over the economics of a nation. Now ask yourselves, do Africans have control of their economics? Do they have control of their national economies? No, it's always a foreign uh, country, a particularly Western country, but also more and more we're seeing Eastern countries such as Russia and China having more and more pull inside of the African continent. So when you have that understanding, be honest. Do you think that Africa is not currently colonized? Of course it's colonized because we can see very clearly we are witnessing a, co a continent that is so without its own self-identity, African identity, totally brainwashed by the West to believe that development that looks like the West is moving forward even when 90% of your people are living in dire poverty. Think about how much of the depraved mindset you have to have to have that. I mean, think about it. One moment you have your people starving and dying. At the same time, you feel empowered because while they're starving and dying, you have a skyscraper that looks just like something in Beijing. That is the depraved mind of Africa. So you have the colonized mind and you also have the colonist who is feeding the system, feeding the education system, feeding the economic system in order to exploit Africa more effectively. So that was not surprising to me once he said he's a Navy SEAL. He said he was a hired mercenary for the United States. Again, there we go. So funny how uh, the U.S. media is so appalled at Russia using mercenary groups in order to do their war and and and. Ukraine, yet here we are hearing that 
in Iraq, there were more mercenaries killing Iraqis than U.S. soldiers. That's a statistic I personally did not know. The other reason that this didn't surprise me is because of this book that I have spoken upon so many times on this channel. You would think that I get a commission from it, but uh, Confessions of an Economic Hitman. You want to understand why the world is controlled? Just read this book. I mean, the guy explained, and it's real cheap on Amazon. You can find like a used version. He, the guy is an ex-economic hitman. And literally his job was to go around the world and blackmail leaders. And not just blackmail because they really didn't have a choice because if they didn't go along with the demands of the CIA or whatever, if they didn't go along with the demands, then basically they would face a coup or an assassination. Literally, we are living in a very controlled environment. So that's my takeaway from the story is that what he's saying, of course, seems abhorrent. But if you're thinking about the fact that this is happening in real time, this man, the reason why he felt so bold to say these things is because he does it. This man worked as has a mercenary firm. This man worked as a Navy SEAL, top escalon inside of the U.S. military. This man has done these things he's talking about. And I'm sure he knows very well that the United States is already out there doing these things in an informal sense. So in his mind, he's like, why not do it in a formal sense? I mean, we're already controlling all of the African economies. Why not just go and do it without trying to appear like we're not? And um, I do want to actually talk about the one point that he made that all of Africa, they're not able to manage their own economies. And so we should do this to help them because they're incapable. The, the, the real truth of the matter is that all of Africa is trying to apply a program that was created to destroy us. We're trying to apply it to ourselves, thinking that we'll be able to benefit the same way that our oppressors benefited from it. So, hey, capitalism worked inside of the United States. Some might say, no, it didn't. You have so many homeless people, poor people, but it seems like it worked. United States, they have better economy. They're controlling the world. Let's do capitalism in Africa. This should work for us. Well, no, that's not how things work because that capitalism was created to exploit you. So if you want Africa to stop seeing, see, being the one to deal with the pain of the economic system, you basically will have to get rid of the economic system and start from scratch. But of course, this is not what they want because it's doing what it is designed to do. So his idea that he would do this in the goodness of his heart, that's imperialist talk. We know that colonists have always tried to mask their own ambitions by making it seem like it's charity. But we know better by now. The widow of assassinated Haitian president has been indicted over his killing. The widow of assassinated Haitian president, Jovenel Moise, was among the 51 people indicted in connection with the 2021 killing Monday, a major step forward for the case after nearly three years. Martin Moise, former prime minister Claude Joseph, and also the former chief of, Na of Haiti's national police, Leon Charles, were the most notable of those charged alongside the mercenaries that went through with the attack and a number of the president's closest aides. The killing sent Haiti into political turmoil, which is only expected to worsen with the news of the arrests. The country is crumbling under surging gang violence and violent protests demanding the resignation of Moise's eventual successor, acting president and prime minister Ariel Henry. It has to be a correction right here. Haiti was already in political turmoil way before this because if you recall before ariel henry took the place of jovenel moise there were protests against jovenel moise mass protests in which seems to be the reason why jovenel moise had to be assassinated because he was no longer an asset to the united states so it says martin and joseph martin moise and joseph were charged with complicity in criminal association accused of knowing about the risk to the president before the assassination Joseph told the Associated Press that the investigation and charges are a part of Henry's efforts to centralize power in the Haitian government. Henry is weaponizing the Haitian justice system, prosecuting political opponents like me. It's a classic coup d'etat, Joseph said. They failed to kill me and Martin Moise on the 7th of July, 2021. Now they're using the Haitian justice system to advance their Machiavellian agenda. Whose side do I take? I actually think that he's probably right. The reason being, while I don't know whether or not Martine Moise, the wife of Juvenal Moise, could have been a part of the plot, I wouldn't put it past anyone. I do know that there was a lot of evidence that Ariel Henry, the current acting president of Haiti and the prime minister of Haiti, actually did have a big role in facilitating this assassination. 
Um, not to mention, um, while he's putting all of these charges on the wife, the charges don't seem to hold a lot of bearing of a bearing effect. He said that the wife should have known that assassination was a risk. What type of charge is that? Um, not to mention the fact also that the CIA was very heavily involved with assassination, assassination, the United States very heavily involved. And so I believe Ariel Henry is trying to distract from the fact that he had a role in this assassination and also the United States government helped him to actually commit it. So what it seems to be is that using the wife as the scapegoat is going to be effective because most people are so appalled that the wife of the prime minister, the man or the president, the woman that laid next to the man night after night, how could she be a part of this assassination that many people are taking their eyes off the fact that it doesn't matter what person in Haiti was the one that was a part of the assassination. We know that the United States government organized the whole thing. Somalia's president is accusing Ethiopia of trying to annex part of its territory. Somali president Hassan Sheikh Mohamud has accused Ethiopia of trying to annex part of his country's territory by signing a sea deal, access deal, with the breakaway Somaliland. Speaking at the African Union Summit in Ethiopia's capital, Addis Ababa on Saturday, Mahamud had also said that Ethiopia's security forces tried to block his access to the summit amid a dispute between the two countries. The agreement between Ethiopia and Somaliland signed on July 1st is nothing more than annexing a part of Somalia to Ethiopia and changing the borders of Somalia, Mohamed told reporters. Somalia categorically objects to that. As part of the deal signed by the Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmad and Somaliland's leader, Mus Bihi Abdi, Somaliland grants Ethiopia a 50-year lease on a naval base with access to Somaliland's Berbera port for commercial marine operations. Neither side has made the term of the deal public, but it appears to give Ethiopia the right to build a port in Somaliland in exchange for recognition. Somaliland has enjoyed de facto independence for three decades, but Somalia considers the self-governing region and its four million people to be a part of its northern territory. Magadishu regards any international recognition of Somaliland as an attack on Somalia, and the Somali government has called for the, the port deal with Addis Ababa outrageous and unauthorized. Ethiopia is misleading the world by claiming that they need an access to the sea, Mohamud said on Saturday. The question is not an access to the sea. The question is how Ethiopia wants to access the sea. He claimed senior officers from Ethiopia's military were in Somaliland preparing the ground for the territorial annexation. It was not possible to verify his allegation. Somalia has also suggested that it would be prepared to go to war to stop Ethiopia from building a port in Somaliland but Ethiopia's Abiy Ahmad had played down affairs as an armed conflict over the Somaliland deal, telling lawmakers earlier this month that he had no intention of going to war with Somalia. So we've been covering this story ongoing. Remember, it initially started because Ethiopia said, hey, we need access to the sea or we need access. We need we need maritime access. They asked Eritrea. Eritrea said no. They asked Djibouti and Somalia. Both of them said no. So what does Ethiopia do? They make a deal with the breakaway province of Somalia, Somaliland. Pretty interesting move. And now basically this puts Ethiopia in the position of possibly having to go to war with Somalia. So that's going to be the question. It's really about whether or not Somalia is really about that life. Or are they going to go to war because of this port inside of, inside of Somaliland? Ethiopia could be facing multiple wars because if you can remember the dam dispute with Egypt, and Sudan, but you know Egypt being the more powerful nation, is also a potential war because if they go forward with this dam, Egypt has hinted at possibly wanting to go to war over that. So it's definitely becoming a situation that you have to watch because this is a very important region for reasons we talk about on this channel, and all of this is unraveling basically the end, the end, like how things are going to unravel how this region is going to be of significance, what's going to happen against the people inside of these regions and beyond. So this is something that you should pay, definitely pay attention to. But with that, let's go to the next story. Probably more than any other part of the African continent, everyone wants a piece of Congo because Congo is so minerally rich. So a new story says that the U.S. has strongly condemned violence in the DR Congo after an alleged drone attack. The United States has condemned growing violence in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, blaming an armed group, it says, is back 
by neighboring Rwanda. Fighting has flared in recent days in the eastern part of the DRC between M23 rebel group and the government forces, resulting in dozens of soldiers and civilians being killed or wounded. The fighting has also pushed tens of thousands of civilians to flee towards the eastern city of Goma, which is located between Lake Kivu and on the border with Rwanda. This escalation has increased the risk to millions of people already exposed to human rights abuses, including displacement, deprivation, and attacks, the U.S. State Department spokesman Matthew Miller said in a statement. The United States condemns Rwanda's support for the M23 armed group and calls on Rwanda to immediately withdraw all Rwandan defense personnel from the DRC and remove its surface-to-air missile systems, which threaten the lives of civilians. The UN and other regional peacekeepers, humanitarian actors, and commercial flights in eastern DRC Congo, Miller added. The DRC and the United Nations and Western countries have accused Rwanda of backing rebels in a bid to control vast mineral resources, which Kigali has denied. The reason why this is so interesting is because if you know the history behind Rwanda's relationship with countries like the United States, you know that Rwanda was literally one of the stooges of the U.S., particularly during the Bill Clinton years. Rwanda was absolutely going into Congo and has never stopped going into Congo to raid for their mineral resources. But guess who was the one who was basically orchestrating it behind the scenes? It was the United States. They were benefiting from it. So they assisted Rwanda. They let Rwanda do horrible atrocities inside of Congo because, again, that was going to help the U.S. So you might want to question why the change in narrative. I believe that one, one, we've been seeing more and more that Pakagame has had relations with China. And I believe that those relations with China, as has been the case with a number of other African countries, is the reason why there's a change in tone. Because he, he's no longer um, reliant on the United States. You know, he even said in statements that Congo, they want mutual mutual relationships. The United States basically bullies their partners, particularly their African partners, into doing what they want. And so he has been very vocal about the fact that he prefers China. Now, if he prefers China and the U.S. could potentially lose one of their main go-tos, which seems like they've lost them in many ways, now he becomes a threat and now he becomes a target. So I'm no way um, sympathetic to Paul Kagame. I mean, anytime you act out of the interests of your people to benefit an oppressor, hey, you're going to reap your reward. But I understand that the U.S. targeting him, first of all, it's unordinary. He has a long history of doing these types of atrocious acts in the Congo. The Let's, I want to talk about the fact that Nigeria's currency has oh, basically plummeted. So Nigeria's currency has fallen to a record low as inflation surges. Nigerians are facing one of the worst economic crises in West Africa in years, triggered by rising inflation rate following monetary policies that have dipped the local currency to an all-time low against the U.S. dollar, provoking anger and protests across the region. The latest government statistics released Thursday show that the inflation rate in January rose to 29.9%, its highest since 1996, mainly driven by food and non-alcoholic beverages. The Naira itself plummeted, get this, to 1524 for one U.S. dollar on Friday, reflecting a 230% loss of value in just one year. It worsens an already bad situation, further eroding incomes and saving while squeezing millions already struggling with hardship due to government reforms that saw the removal of gas subsidies, resulting in gas prices tripling and the transport fares spiking. With a population of more than 210 million people, Nigeria is not just Africa's most populous country, but also the continent's largest economy. This is very significant because this is happening around the world. We have to understand that a big part of why the economic system is going to shift and it's going to shift suddenly is because of things like inflation. Things becoming, uh, currency becoming so devalued that it really is like, why do we even have this currency? We hear that difference, 1,005. 1,524 Naira equal to one U.S. dollar. I mean, that is insane. It, I, I've never heard of anything so bad as far as like, you know, countries in recent history, but that's crazy. And the fact that people are struggling, that's the other thing to keep in mind, or protests that are happening. So this creates the atmosphere that we can anticipate, we have been anticipating an atmosphere where basically it's been sold all over the world and particularly it's being sold in the West. 
that we need to have a singular world currency. And so it's being sold, it's being packaged. And one of the things that leads to the argument or voices the argument that we need a singular currency is when one currency is just so bad that protests are happening. Understand, Nigeria is a country that's very consequential because it has the largest African population, it has the largest African economy, but uh, more and more, you're going to have more Nigerians that are going to be looking for other places because they can't find a livelihood in their own country. And then and already, you know, there's a lot of Nigerians all over the world. Nigerians are very hated. And I don't think it's a coincidence that the hatred of Nigerians is also linked to who they are. Um, many of them are. So we have to understand that Nigeria and the fact that this country could be plummeting definitely, definitely is going to have a wide effect and going to bolster the narrative as with the collapse of every economy that there has to be a change in currency. Otherwise, we're basically going to be having protests, mass migration that the West does not want. And that, I think, will basically be the selling point. You know, most people have a hatred, um, particularly, well, unfortunately, a lot of people, even in African people, have a weird hatred of Nigerians. And I think that the fact that Nigerians are going into other countries and trying to find or make a living leads to xenophobia, not just in the West, but also in Africa. Again, these are all selling points. If you can't stand your own people, you can't deal with your own people, and this is the problem that you identify that and this is the solution, then they'll give you that solution and you'll receive it and you'll take it and you'll be happy to take it because you think it's going to rid you of a bigger problem. So. Um, with that, I am uh, going to wrap it up for this week. Thank you all for watching, and y'all willing, I'll see you all in the next week. Songs you often refer to the Bible, but many of the young people who are coming to your concert yeah. don't believe in the Bible anymore. Because the way they've been taught about the Bible, that is not the way of the Bible. You know what I mean? Because if I was living in that world where the everyday interpretation of the Bible go on, then I would have eaten the Bible too. But now that we have found the right way of the Bible, then the Bible is to be loved because the Bible is a record of man creation. It's the only book tell you. It's the only book can make can show you where mankind begins without any prejudice or any, any, anything like that, any boastfulness, pride or anything. It just have out there and that's it. Well, all the Christian people, not even the Christian, all the, all the people who go to churches, interpret the Bible and the preach as them. That is not the right way. Because the greatest thing is that life. See, it's life. Life I deal with. If the preacher read the Bible and tell you that you have to die to go to heaven, then he mean is not reading the Bible. Because the Bible tells you you have to live in a heaven. You don't die and go to heaven, you have to live in heaven. You know, a lot of places on earth could be. But Africa is our heaven. Because that's where we come from. You know, maybe if it's a Swiss, maybe if you're from Switzerland and people know God, then maybe you can live in peace, you want to harm and you know, you know. But you know, people are stubborn and desert because of material vanity. To a time when the emperor first became a symbol of his country and of all Africa. Only a veteran can now remember when the last and most brutal chapter of the European scramble for Africa began. 1935, Italy claimed Ethiopia and Mussolini's troops invaded. Arriverà al benessere, alla potenza e alla gloria. Black men the bugle call, come on, come on the drums are beating and the bugle call. At 
the League of Nations in Geneva, the Emperor went to plead Ethiopia's just cause. The League, fearful of a shadow which would turn into the Second World War, did nothing. Shamefully, the great powers left Ethiopia to Mussolini and the Emperor to lonely exile in England. His Majesty, the Negus Haile Selassie, I call upon the first delegate of Ethiopia. Nowhere, I think, was the Emperor's tragedy felt more deeply than among the black people of the West, the slave descendants in North America and the Caribbean. Black consciousness had dawned in Jazz Age Harlem, and Africa fermented in the exile's hearts. Many supported a black activist called Marcus Garvey, and when he demanded Africa for the Africans and repatriation to the homeland, they saw Ethiopia as a special symbol of the whole continent. Until now, it alone had not been seized by white Europeans. Such people volunteered to fight for Haile Selassie, although only a handful managed to go, or they organized to send relief. Black American rallied towards the cause and black Jamaicans likewise and so the organization was formed in New York, 105th to 1 Lenox Avenue, New York, and as uh, Ethiopian World Federation Corporation. Those people gave up money, medicine, clothes and what have you sent into Do You think of yourself more as an African than a Jamaican? Yeah, because one of the main things is that we are Rasta. From you accept Rasta, you become a Ethiopian, which is Africa. Next thing again, the history of Jamaica shows that the Arawak Indian was living there, and it belonged to the Arawak Indian. Now, our history shows that through slave business, black people come out of the West and thing, you know? So we still figure, say, Africa is a root, you know? And this is where we must return to. What do you see as most of uh, Africa's problems as far as uniting? I mean, I see Africa problem is that outside people keep on fatiguing the people, you know, and make them can't really get them things together. You know, if it's not this superpower, it's that superpower. But Africa is only a place which part of music exploit, you know. Nobody not really. Africa Africa so rich that it, it become a man just gonna Africa steal out of him and steal and carry back in a theme country. And Africa stay the like, you know? Go Africa ready. Af uh, Garvey used to say Africa for the Africans. Is that how you feel? Yeah, Africa for Africans, a woman abroad, you know. True. Sure. <laughs> will your will your home base though always be Jamaica? Or someday do you would, no, would you like to live in Africa? No, going to be in Africa. Yeah. Maybe we open a Jerusalem. You know what I mean? Let them Bible land.